everybody's comfy? Great. So, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Felix. I have been a thought worker since 2016. I'm a developer by trade and security is my pet topic in its various shapes or forms. So this talk will be a bit more than yeah, a bit more than half an hour. That's a lot of context to go through. So we'll have more than enough time for questions and answers. Um, also, you can catch me in the crowd later. People have told me that I'm kind of hard to overlook. So, well, anyway, so for some time now, uh, cybersecurity is all the rage, right? Despite loads of uh, security requirements, however, most applications and frameworks are still riddled with uh, vulnerabilities. Frameworks are not being maintained, uh, components aren't updated, and so on and so forth, right? So feature pressure always trumps the will to dig through tech debt. So let's have a look at how to formulate um, the narrative to reasonably build security into software engineering and to make it the first class citizen it deserves to be. All right, so news always comes first and then comes the shock. So a lot of companies learn from successful attacks on their infrastructure, mostly from news coverage. Even though we got better, the mean time to discovery is still frighteningly high. So 99 days was the latest number that I found for 2016, down from uh, 416 days in 2012. So things are improving, but since this is the mean time, you know, in some cases, this means it's also in the range of years or just, they just never discover it. Let's keep in mind that the number of attacks are rising. So the technical complexity, on the other hand, on the attacker's side declines. You know, the tools are getting better. We have tools like Burp Suite, we have Zed, we have um, Metasploit frameworks and so on and so forth. So the tools are getting better, both on the defenders as on the attacker's side. But you know, um, anything, any machine, including light bulbs, baby monitors, dishwashers, so anything that is reachable from the internet is under scrutiny at any given point in time. So while attacks were isolated events just a few years back, they've become a regular thing now and cyber attacks or incidents are having a substantial impact uh, on the company's stock price. And while we have yet to observe a major tech company going bankrupt after a hack, the effects are tangible even for top management. Examples include Target and Equifax recently. So anyway, once a security hole is discovered, then usually digital forensics are called in, um, environments are being walled off, you know, external penetration testers roll in. And it's actually not surprising for the teams, uh, for, the, for the investigation teams to discover that the people on the ground often knew in advance what was wrong. And while the team members are often aware of the things that, needs fi uh, that need fixing, uh, things do get lost in translation sometimes. So this anti-pattern initially mentioned is called the security sandwich. So framed with requirements and audits and penetration tests lies the agile development process full of its inherent uncertainties. Right? And new learnings, we discover things on a daily basis and we reprioritize. But often the development process itself is largely ignorant towards security. So instead of short-circuiting here and looking for simple solutions, let's take a step back and investigate a counter-proposal uh, to the security sandwich. Let's have a look at how to create a shared responsibility for security. So the three movements that have radically transformed the tech landscape over the last couple of years were design thinking with the objective fitness for use, a lean startup methodology with the objective product market fit, and the DevOps culture with the objective responsiveness. The common theme here is uh, that they include the objectives early on in the development process, all three of them, rather than tacking it on as an afterthought. It's really hard to design a system well when it's already built. So now it's easy to see why it's orders of magnitude harder to effectively retrofit security instead of baking it into the development process, right? If you want to refer to it in marketing heavy words, you can call it SecDevOps or DevSecOps or any permutation of these three things or shift security left. So this is the words that you're typically hearing here. So now that we've spoken about the problem, um, let's dive into what can be done about it. So many risk estimation frameworks use a version of the so-called calculus of negligence, which tries to quantify exposure by looking at impact and severity of abuse. There is nothing inherently wrong with these models as they are widely used to you know, quantify and analyze exposure um, and potential liability of a company. As an example, for those familiar with uh, risk estimation models, OpenFAIR's model of quantifying inherent risk works pretty much along those lines. However, even though these models are not directly actionable and produce little guidance as to where and how 
to implement controls and to mitigate risks. Understanding exposure can inform the software development life cycle, software delivery life cycle, um, and can give context to putting security practices into place. Um, by the way, I will refer to the uh, software delivery life cycle from now on as SDLC because it's less of a tongue twister. So this is my favorite quote uh, when it comes to security because it perfectly sums up why executives have stopped listening to security experts a long time ago. So your job is to facilitate the business, to operate in an as assured as possible manner, given the actual mission of the business, and providing that context for people that aren't security professionals, as well as for those that are. Here's how important this thing is in the grand scheme of things. So let's break down how we can go about creating this context. So in order to understand where to focus your efforts and communicating that to management, you need to understand which assets your application is handling and why they are valuable. So assets are generally valuable goods of physical or immaterial nature, such as you know, production machines, order data, financial transactions, or personally identifying information. Assets are inspected in the context of software to be built in order to understand how the system might be attacked to get a hold of those assets, as well as how, when, and where to defend them. So also you need to know what the impact is should a risk materialize and your efforts to protect an asset fail. So in that sense, um, assets are the targets for both deliberate or negligent threats from inside or outside your organization. So let's start with understanding an asset's value. Value is created through transformation or indexing or contextualizing or just display of physical goods or real world behavior. Examples include uh, e-commerce systems, you know, where a customer orders goods or fleet management solutions or warehouse solutions, user interaction analytics, you get the idea. So another class of value creation in that sense might be digital services such as you know, streaming services where the entirety and the integrity of the user experience is also an asset. Your job is to assure that this value creation based upon the asset can be realized. You know, this is why we're here. So the goal of a risk profiling exercise is to identify and understand potential um, attacks as well as unforeseen or negligent failure to an organization in the context of your systems. To this end, understanding an asset gives you insight into the corresponding security goals, which derive from either legal or regulatory requirements or business experience, business requirements. So security goals are, and you might have heard about them from other places, so the first one is confidentiality, component of privacy that protects our data from disclosure to unauthorized parties. Second one is integrity of information. It refers to the condition where information is kept accurate and consistent unless authorized changes are made. You know, information only has value if it is correct, hence we're protecting it from being modified. And the third one is availability. Availability is the key for any information system to serve its purpose. Um, information must be available, it must be obtainable, it must be usable when needed. Compromising availability has become very common nowadays. We all have heard about uh, denial of service attacks. So these three security goals, confidentiality, integrity, and availability, are also commonly referred to as the CIA triad. It's pretty easy to remember that. So once you know about your security goals that you have to keep in place, the next thing is to think about what happens when a security goal is broken. That's also referred to as a disaster scenario. So disaster scenarios carry impact to your business and uh, these risks basically constitute your application's risk profile. Disaster scenarios will serve as the basis for your threat model, which allows you to understand ahead of time where attacks are likely to come from, what an attack is likely to look like, and what can go wrong at that point. It allows us to rationally discuss in which way failure or attack patterns can harm our businesses. So for the SDLC, this means that our business stakeholders actually have to sit down with the delivery team. So the, this joint task uh, is a first step in creating you know, shared responsibility for security between the business and the delivery team. So roughly speaking, in a risk profiling exercise, you would have each participant come up with a number of assets that are handled by the application. So for every asset, you would then ask, you know, what happens if confidentiality, integrity, or availability are broken? And you can assign a monetary value to that. It might not be easy to come, with that number, uh, come up with that number, but it often comes in useful in, in later discussions when you're 
basically arguing why this is why the security measure is important to build in. Um, in the example of an e-commerce shop, an order fulfillment system is an asset, right? So non-availability of this asset results in a revenue loss of X euros per hour. Sometimes it's harder to quantify them. You can also go in like small, medium, large impact. Whatever works for you in that case. Anyway, so gathering these assets in asset libraries um, allows us to make security relevant decision within an application development based on security goals by creating a common language between the business and the delivery team, right? So we've spoken about risk profiling, um, but the problem is, even though understanding our exposure is nice and is helpful, these risk models still do not readily yield um, action items for how to improve our overall security posture and which controls to implement and exactly where to implement them. Right? So this is done in a second step. So that second step is called a path to production. The path to production answers the question of where quote unquote, where security happens during software development. So let's take a look at how our teams create value. The, the idea of a path to production is adapted from a lean value stream mapping. Maybe some in the room have heard about that? Not? Okay. Well, you've heard about it now. This is used in the manufacturing industry to uh, improve production throughput. Cost of delay is something that comes from this discipline, right? So a path to production visualizes the many steps that the teams take. Agile SDLCs will often you know, roughly look like this. So stakeholders get together, they discuss things, they discuss requirements, ideas, or needs, or demands, or whatever. And that stuff is usually covered in protocols or reports. These inform decisions by other groups and committees down the road. And at some point, this stuff comes together in an epic. Right. So an EPIC roughly outlines scopes for delivery work, and then this is the point where the team comes in. These EPICs are then broken down into stories, which are scoped, which also have acceptance criteria. And these stories are then developed one at a time and deployed into production. So in every activity in the context of application development in a path to production uh, is registered and brought into a logical and chronological order. In software development, this path is typically constantly fed with new proposals or insights, and every team member is working on at some point in the path to production at any given point in time. If you've done such an exercise of mapping that out at the end, uh, you will be left with a pretty big piece of paper that shows the reality of the team in an abstract way, but accurately and believably. The reason we're doing this in the context of security is that security work starts with the first discussion of features, right? Long before a story appears on a Kanban board, way before that time. And path to productions create a shared responsibility across the entire team, including the, the business stakeholders that are involved in the initial discussions. And it creates empathy for the work the other team members do. And that is crucial for establishing shared context and shared understanding and shared responsibility. Let's you know, take this and let's take a path to production and, and walk through it. So let's take a look at the analysis phase. We typically break down high-level business requirements into uh, scoped chunks of requirements. So security considerations, as I said, in this phase have a high leverage and the input for these security considerations comes from, as I said before, the asset library. We have the security goals, we have our disaster scenarios. That informs any decisions taken here. So. Threat modeling allows us to proactively identify uh, potential issues in the technical design of an application. So it's a, a good practice to understand cross-functional requirements that need to be scoped into a story and incorporated into the technical architecture. Threat models tie the delivery and assurance work within the team back to the management layer of the organization based on the assets we talked about earlier. So the interesting part here is that whatever you come up with in a threat modeling exercise, any countermeasures you decide on, they are not decided upon in isolation in the team. It needs to be in agreement with the business side of your organization. The four typical courses of action to any findings are accept, avoid, transfer, or mitigate a threat. All of the above strategies are equally valid. And uh, please also note that it is equally valid to mitigate the risk as it is to mitigate the outcome. A good threat model makes that context clear. Either way, so any actions you agree upon need to be signed off by the business, typically represented by the product owner, and then followed up on and implemented by the team. So I strongly advise um, giving security considerations and, and threat modeling a dedicated space in your path to production. This can be done, in, for example, in the form of a definition of ready. So if not, if this doesn't work for you, adding threat modeling and security to your definition of ready, you can also run recurring sessions, but 
please make sure that you run them regularly, say every two weeks, every four weeks. It's more important to do threat modeling regularly than having a threat modeling session every quarter, every half a year. All right, I've spoken a lot about threat modeling. Let's dive into what actually, what we can do there. I'll dive first into the agile threat modeling part in the middle, then into the scenario-based threat modeling, and then I'll give a quick note about exploratory methods like attack trees. So as for the agile part, um, when we're modeling threats, we our goal is to find the highest value security work we can do um, and get that into the team's backlog right away. We do this by applying a time box so that we threat model little and often, and uh, we capture different parts of the system every time we do this, and we try different zoom levels. So over time, all these different perspectives and, and zoom levels help us to get a good overview of the system, and threat modeling becomes a part of your continuous agile development process, right? One thing that I really like doing, and I brought a bunch of these uh, toolkits here, so I have 10 of them here, it's first come, first serve afterwards. Brainstorming with uh, Stride. Who in this room has heard about Stride? One, two, three, four, five, cool. So Stride, ba basically brainstorming based on Stride is quick and, uh, and flexible to extend your ways of working and to understand what can go wrong. Basically Stride is an acronym for spoofed identity, tampering with input, repudiation of action, information disclosure, denial of service, and escalation of privilege. So these are basically ways in which your application, your systems can be broken. It's a pretty popular toolkit. So you would investigate the current iterations functionality delta, or if you integrate it into your definition of ready, the functionality delta in that story to understand how that functionality can be attacked or otherwise broken. Heads up, um, many threat modeling frameworks advise you to name a threat actor. Uh, in my personal experience, this is rather hard uh, to come up with a believable threat actor, and it doesn't really yield better results, un basically, unless you're likely to be attacked by the NSA. You know, just keep it rational. And should you actually be afraid of being attacked by the NSA, I truly wonder why you're sitting here, because you should be knowing that stuff already. But jokes aside, um, the next step is basically to, to map and order the findings according to their impact. So you've done threat modeling, you have your findings, what do we tackle first, right? It's about getting the highest value um, out of this exercise. So just take a moment to reflect on what's going to happen to the business in case this actually came to pass. So you have written down the context for that in the asset library. I'm referring to that pretty often. So are you going out of business? Are you going to spend a day recovering your database? Do you lose a competitive advantage? or? Is it possible that your elaborate disaster scenario is just maybe a minor nuisance at best? Uh, so anyway, the top threats can then be picked up as uh, additional acceptance criteria to be added to a user story, uh, security debt that you can track on a radiator in your team space, um, changes to your team's definition of done, time box spikes, epics to implement them, whatever. Should this agile threat modeling part be not for you? Um, maybe because it doesn't work, because your team is not experienced enough to do that, um, you can also run tabletop exercises, and this is the scenario-based approach. Uh, so tabletop exercises are for inexperienced teams to understand security risk. A team would be basically confronted with a couple of disaster scenarios and would list all the necessary countermeasures. So this technique draws on pre-existing knowledge, maybe from former engagements or something, and uh, tries to map that to the current tech stack and to the current architecture. So you look at things like um, boundaries and interfaces with other services, with other systems, um, those might break. You look at recovering from unavailability, or you look at recovering from unexpected data loss, graceful degradation because third-party services aren't there, all of these things, right? Just be creative when you come up with these ways in which your system can fail. There is a third part that is the exploratory methods, like attack trees. Those are recommended if you have a critical component in the context of high-risk, high-yield assets or if you're doing digital forensics. Um, attack trees are basically a method of analyzing the security of a system top-down. So you start from your, well, observed results.